So Clarity 2, this is a presentation, uh, second one that I've done on the effects of coronavirus on real estate in South Florida and the rest of the United States. So who am I? My name is Jay Fletcher. I am in the Miami-Dade area. Uh, I'm in Miami, Florida, but I work the metro area. So Miami-Dade, Broward, and Palm Counties, Palm Beach Counties. Uh, I'm a real estate investor. I'm a realtor at Remax Advance. There's my contact information, my phone number, my IG if you want to go ahead and follow, uh, and my email as well as my YouTube channel, which I definitely recommend that you go ahead and check that out. That's youtube.com slash C slash Jake Fletcher, and it's growing by the minute, my YouTube channel. It's awesome, so check it out. I have a lot of different types of cool content on there. All right, David, what's up, man? Working hard on a Friday. Ya tu sabes, you already know. Thank you for commenting. Uh, now I know where those will appear. So let me know if the audio sounds good. Hopefully it does. I spent some time trying to figure out a, a what should be a good audio situation with an SM7 microphone and preamps and everything. So who I'm not, I'm not your professional money manager. I'm not your lawyer. I'm not your financial advisor. I'm not an economist. I'm not a policymaker. And believe it or not, I'm also not a psychic. So Keep those things in mind as you watch this presentation. Good news, everyone. Business is still happening. So real estate is has proven over time to be a consistently stable commodity, which tends to recover quickly in comparison with others, other commodities. And right now, we've already seen that the industry is adapting quickly to these new changes and circumstances. A lot of buyers were already in the market to buy and still have a need to buy. Some of them are in the market now and they weren't before. Maybe they have to move for some reason or they might have lost their job and are pursuing a job somewhere else. Awesome. Thank you on the audio feedback, Simon and David. Appreciate it. So, or maybe they have a family member they have to take care of somewhere else. Who knows? But there could be people and there are people who are now in the market for a home. I have a client who their income has exploded because of uh, what's going on. And now they are not only in the home and the market to buy a home, but they're going to be selling their home, etc. So, uh, also sellers, uh, it's transitioning, nice little transition into that. Sellers who are still on the market, um, who were on the market and still on the market, clearly also have a need to sell, especially if they're occupying the home. Because you can imagine you're in your home, people are you know, coming in and who knows who has coronavirus or not. <laughs> so if you're occupying your home and trying to sell it, you de definitely have a need to sell. Investors are getting their war chests ready. We're going to talk about that. Interest rates are still very low. Talk to my man, David DeMarchena, about that. Uh, it's a great, great time to refinance uh, or to cash out on some of the equity that you have in your home if that's the right move for you. Not saying to use your home uh, equity as a piggy bank, but if you can do it responsibly, it can be something very beneficial, especially with the low rates right now. So whether you're selling or you're looking for a home equity line of credit, now's a great time to do that. So there's a lot of good news. There's some really encouraging news from uh, National Association of Realtors too, which I'm gonna be getting to in a bit. What are we up against exactly? Well, a pandemic, uh, which is in economic terms considered a black swan event, which means that, that there was really no way to predict when it was going to happen, what it was going to be, if it was going to really happen, how it's going to affect everything, etc. Just a completely unpredictable event that shakes up the world economy. That's a black swan. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty around that specifically, as well as in general about the economy and other major factors we're going to be talking about here. There's been a volatile stock market. Anyone who is involved in stocks or you know has any, even if you have a TV, you probably know that it's very volatile right now. Uh, historic mass unemployment, 36 and a half million people have filed unemployment since mid-March, which uh, when you figure out what percentage of the working population that is, it's about 22.3%. Okay, so of 163 and a half million people that are over the age of uh, 16 and also are either full-time employed, part-time employed, looking for employment, or they recently uh, stopped looking for employment, uh, that's 22.3% of that number of people 
who have recently filed unemployment. Now, caveat to that, some people may be filing unemployment, but they are still partially employed because now they've changed it where, you know, changed up the, the requirements to where you can file for unemployment, even if your business has just been affected by a coronavirus, not necessarily put to an end. So there's fears of a widespread recession and a long-term comeback for the economy that could take years and things are changing by the hour. So there's just a lot of, of craziness going on in the, the whole world economy uh, and it's really uncertain exactly how things are gonna pan out because we don't know what's gonna happen with the virus. So really uncertainty is the main thing we're up against, not the virus uh, in terms of economic, uh, in terms of economics. On to the next side. How has the industry changed so far? So there's been a huge decrease in showings, basically no open houses. In fact, they have all become virtual open houses and virtual showings are becoming increasingly more common. Uh, I've done virtual showings. I've also done in-person showings. They're not all virtual, um, but there are more requirements for people uh, viewing a home, like you gotta wear a mask, et cetera. Um, also, some sellers are requiring more information up front to qualify. Like you can't just go look at a house. You have to have proof of funds. You have to, you know, prove that you, uh, you know, are basically, well, some of them are actually making you go under contract, uh, first. So what that means is you actually have to go under contract, but then there's a clause that it's pending the buyers actually seeing the house in the inspection period. So you go under contract and then you have the inspection period, which is, you know, seven to 10 days or so that the buyer has to actually go see the house. If there's anything they don't like about it at all, they can pull out with no penalty whatsoever or losing their escrow. Um, there's also COVID-19 addenda that have been created by the Florida Realtors and Remax Advance, my brokerage, which basically there's multiple addenda, but the main one that the public needs to know about is that there are extensions to contract, meaning that that because of COVID-19, things are taking longer and they are, uh, you know, basically people are, the buyer and seller are agreeing to be more flexible time-wise and that things are gonna take a little longer, basically. Oops, low inventory, but there's a much smaller buyer pool. Um, this is, there's actually, we've had a higher month of inventory, which means that the amount of time that it would take if no new listings came on the market for all of the listings to sell, uh, in months, right? So, you know, eight months of inventory, uh, for example. Uh, so there's a low inventory, but there's a much smaller buyer pool, okay? So those two things have balanced out uh, to kind of stabilize the market a little bit, right? Uh, but we definitely don't wanna see that prolonged for a super long time. We're gonna talk about that more. Lenders are making guidelines much stricter and they also are changing hourly. Call your lender for sure if you were thinking about buying before or you were in the process and make sure that you still qualify if you were already looking to buy because things have changed a lot. Even just today, things are always changing with the lender requirements. Uh, so we're gonna talk about that too. Deals are taking more time, lenders are backed up, banks are scrambling with the stimulus lending that they're trying to figure out how to do in addition to their normal activities all the components of the industry adapting in real time to handle familiar activities under new circumstances. So imagine all these things that people, you know, the, all these aspects of the sale of a home, uh, like going into your bank to get money transferred via a wire. Now your bank may require an appointment and that's gonna take you longer time. It might take longer to get an inspection company out. It's gonna take longer for title to clear because the courthouses aren't open and so on and so forth. So deals are taking a lot longer time right now. So be aware of that. Let's talk about the 305. All right, so let's go to our statistics. We could talk about these in great detail okay but we're going to not talk about them in super great detail because i don't want to bore anyone to tears but here's what we're looking at for single family homes i'm going to give you guys the highlights so we're looking at uh you can kind of disregard the march of 2019 um, that's just to give us this year year over year change here uh to compare uh to and basically we're looking at march 2020 and april 2020 Okay, we're comparing year over year, March 2020 change, which means March of 2020 to March 2019, the percentage of change. And then we're also comparing the percentage of change 
uh, of April 2020 to March of 2020. So that's a one month change in this column right here, okay? And then we're gonna be comparing this April that just passed to year over year April as well over here. So April 2019, all right? So the main takeaways here, okay? And we're gonna do single family homes and we're also going to do condos and townhomes on the next page. Main takeaways here, new listings are down tremendously. We can see 35.8% average uh, is in single family homes uh, since March of 2020, which was a 18% decrease, okay? So year over year, this is a 49% decrease of new listings. So April of last year had 49% more uh, new listings during the month of April. All right, number of sales is also down year over year, 31%, okay? Not great. So remember we talked about the, the months of inventory earlier. We can see here, this is probably one of the more statistically significant points of this whole uh, chart, uh, of spreadsheet. Eight months of inventory for homes that are under $700,000, okay? Single family homes under 700,000 is only eight months of inventory. Last couple weeks ago when I did this, all these numbers were all out of whack because we only had half of the month at that time. Now we have the whole month of data so we can actually see what it is. So eight months of inventory is actually considered a normal market, all right? So between one to six months of inventory, that is a seller's market. Uh, between six to 12 months of inventory, that is considered normal market activity. Anything over 12 months of, of inventory is considered a buyer's market because there's so much inventory, buyers have a lot of choices and they have the leverage uh, to get good deals, it becomes a buyer's market. It's the opposite for a seller's market. Right now, that's a normal market, eight months of inventory. It's really not crazy. Uh, it is up 60% year over year, right? Because we were at five months of inventory, but you know, that's only three months change. It's significant, right? But it's it's not as doom and gloom as uh, some people might have have expected. All right. So let's go ahead and uh, and check out what's going on with condos and townhomes. So condos and townhomes, we see even more drastic numbers. So check out the new listings year over year, April to uh, 2020 to April 2019. 54% decrease in number of new listings, right? Compared to 49, so it's up, you know, almost 5%, 4.6% uh, less new listings in condos and townhomes. Uh, number of sales down 55.8%, which is crazy. Um, I mean, compare that here to 31.1%. That's a big, big difference in how many number of sales of townhouses and condos there are versus uh, the, the single family homes. So 55.8% less year over year. Now here's where things get just absolutely crazy um, in months of inventory. Under 700,000, even the cheaper condos are 21 months of inventory, uh, which is a 90%, 90 point, 91 basically percent increase of months of inventory. 700,000 to a million is 83 months of inventory. A million plus is 66 months of inventory, okay? So which is a 159% increase and 94% increase respectively. Wild, insane, just crazy months of inventory. Um, so the big takeaways from these two data sets are if you're buying a house, single family home under 700,000, maybe don't be too expectant that you will see a crazy drop in prices or that you'll be able to get the most amazing deals ever. Uh, although there is a decrease in the, the pool of buyers, those buyers are also going to be qualified buyers like yourself uh, and you're going to have kind of stiffer competition even though there's less competition. There's gonna be a higher percentage of quality competition out there. So you might not see very much discounts in the under 700 range for single family homes. Conversely, condos, you're about to, people are gonna be just giving condos away pretty soon. Uh, I mean, just imagine owning a, a condo that's a $900,000 condo and you're looking at 83 months of inventory. Well, if you get a good qualified buyer for a cash deal, maybe you're asking you know, 900,000 and they offer you 750, man, that you might wanna take that, you know? Um, so craziness, craziness all around. Those are the stats for, for Miami Dade. Go ahead and screenshot if you want to screenshot that. I'll give you guys a quick second to screenshot this so you can like peer into the data for yourself. 
Um, so I'll give you like five seconds here and then I'll give you five seconds on the other page. Uh, and then that way you guys have the, the option to go back and check it out. Uh, I would, this will be recorded on my profile. So uh, my profile, I think it's public profile. So even if you're not my Facebook friend, you can come back and check it out later, watch the whole video. But here's the single family homes. Uh, if you want to go ahead and screenshot that as well. And if you're a total nerd like me, <laughs> then you may really enjoy to go back and just try and see what you can glean out of this data. And uh, just keep in mind, this is Miami-Dade, okay? Uh, as I said before. So let's go back to our presentation. Mr. 305, lead us on to the next one. So data for the entire United States. So definitely subscribe to my YouTube channel once again for all the updates. I'm going to keep that going. Uh, last time I did this presentation, it was 2.9. Now it's 4.6 million people have requested mortgage forbearance, which is 8.8% of all outstanding mortgage loans or $1.03 trillion dollars. Uh, in total uh, principal owed. And that's coming from nationalmortgagenews.com. Um, so basically that forbearance is not paying your mortgage for three to 12 months because you've been affected by the loans, uh, which means honestly, a lot of people might be getting screwed because at the end of that time period, it's all due in a lump sum. Unless the government comes and steps in and does some things differently or you know, we'll see what kind of help they give people. A lot of people might be getting screwed uh, and there might be foreclosures uh, coming in droves in the future, but we'll see how that plays out and I'll definitely be keeping everybody updated on that. Uh, but this would be a catastrophe for the mortgage market and people's credit scores. Um, so, you know, the, the CARES Act protected your credit from April, May, and June, right? The first CARES Act, we know we have another CARES Act coming, uh, but we don't really know exactly what happens afterwards, right? So what's going to happen if you are a, a, a landlord or if you are a homeowner and you're not paying your mortgage because you went into forbearance, uh, you know, you'll have to go talk to the loss mitigation at your bank, uh, you know, basically good luck getting a hold of them first of all but then once you do you'll have to prove hardship and you'll have to also already be at least 30 days late on your payment which means a minimum 100 point credit score drop okay so disaster for a lot of people's credit scores loss mitigation is going to determine what to do with you after you have no leverage okay so time is your leverage here right and once it passes your payments are missed and the time is gone and you have no leverage the bank is hemorrhaging money and they're just going to give you the one option so be proactive uh, go ahead and, and try and get ahead of that if you are a homeowner or a landlord and you're thinking that you might have to go into forbearance really get ahead of it consider it maybe don't do it if you don't absolutely have to definitely don't if you don't have to um, you know, they might ask you to they require you to liquidate assets uh, and then you won't be able to refinance later and take advantage of these low scores because you won't qualify to refinance with a lower credit score, right? Imagine you had a 720, well now you have a 620, right? Or a 700 to a 600 and now you just simply don't qualify for refinancing. Um, so, or even if you do, if you had a lower credit score and you do still qualify, but you're still kind of on the lower end of it, you're gonna ha might be able to refinance, but you're gonna have a much higher rate, so it probably won't make sense to refinance at that point in time. All right, we're gonna talk about the NAR uh, data that just came out. So this is the, the National Association of Realtors uh, March, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, the, yeah, it's the March housing sales. Um, and then there's also, I have some uh, quarter one metro house pricing statistics uh, later on in the slides here, but we're starting off with the March home sales here. So this is actually some good news. And now keep in mind, big asterisk on this that, okay, the month of March was about 50-50 split. The first half of March, you know, the, the birds were singing, you know, the everything was normal. Uh, you know, every everybody, things seemed normal, right? Second half of March, the Armageddon, the sky is falling and turning red and, you know, the volcano just erupting. I mean, just everything went down, right? So everyone was freaking out. So March is about 50-50 split between, you know, the, the pre-Rona stats and the post-beginning of Rona stats. So keep that in mind here. But considering how drastic this has been in an effect to our economy and real estate and everything, uh, the, the stats that we see here, I think are, are somewhat encouraging. So 
What we see here is every couple of months since 2016, uh, the, the total existing home sales, right? So you can see hovering around that five, uh, five and a half million, uh, you know, mark, right? You know, going back and forth, back and forth. And then right recently we saw a pretty big dip, right? So that's not necessarily good news, but when you zoom out of that, you see, well, okay, we're still pretty much in the ballpark of where we've been since 16, since 2016. Uh, and actually we're above where we were at a certain point, uh, you know, right before 2019 began, uh, the beginning of 2019. Um, so to put it into context, all right, uh, existing home me sales median price. So this is the median price of existing homes, which is, of course, existing homes are different from new homes. We look at those differently. So this is a percent change year over year. So homes have been gaining value nationally every single year uh, for a long time. This is just 2019 every month uh, since 2000, March 2019. And you can see there's been positive increase in home value year over year each of those months. And even up until March, we had 8% increase in median sales price. Uh, so that's pretty actually, that kind of surprised me when I saw that. Um, so I expected it at least to be down there in like the 4% range. So, uh, pretty interesting, pretty, pretty good, you know, kind of good news there. Median price of existing home sales here. Uh, we've seen median price increase year over year, pretty much, uh, consistently. You'll see that it kind of goes up in certain months and comes down in other months, AKA in the summer homes are more expensive. Um, because there's more demand and that's how economics works. Uh, but you can see we're still on an upward trajectory, about $280,000 uh, for a median price of an existing home. Total existing home sales percentage change year over year. So this one actually, I was kind of surprised, um, you know, to see this, this chart here, the, the way it looks, right? So we have the percentage change year over year of the, the total existing home sales. Right, and then we have basically each month since uh, March of 2019. So we saw we were in a negative, uh, negative uh, a decrease of total existing home sales for the first four months of this chart, and then it's been positive ever since. Now you say, well, Jake, you know, since December of 2019, it's been going down every month. Well, yeah, it has been going down, and, and you see a precipitous drop off between February and March, and that's where we see the the rony rones really kicking in, but it's still positive, right? There's still an increase year over year from March of 2019, where we were freaking negative 6% uh, from the year before that. So I see that as, as not as bad as it could be. <laughs> it could be worse, you know? Uh, so keeping it going, market conditions, who is actually out there buying right now? So 2020, you see in red and 2019, you see in pink uh, or whatever color that is, uh, 34% of buyers are first time home buyers versus 33% last year, 13% uh, to investors versus 18 the year before, right? So that's kind of interesting. Uh, less investors are seeing opportunity uh, in March last month and probably because of a very good reason we had coronavirus going on <laughs> and they weren't, nobody was sure what was gonna happen. Cash sales also down, but only 1% and distress sales were the same. Um, so just kind of interesting to see first time buyers, you know, ticking up there uh, shows a good sign economically that first time buyers are able to actually afford a home even when the world's kind of crumbling uh, and, and not very surprising to see a decrease in sales to investors because we're going to definitely be seeing an increase in that in coming months. I'll talk about that more in a bit. Housing supply at the national level, this is an interesting one. So you have your national months of supply, that's that months of inventory, but on a national level. Uh, you, have your, uh, you have your single family months of supply, and then your condos, co-ops, which is um, a co-op. I don't wanna go into what a co-op is right now. Um, it's like shared interest in owning a, a, a property. Uh, but basically condos and months of supply. So you can see there's a lot more supply of condos nationally than there is of single family homes, uh, which mirrors what we saw in our Miami-Dade data earlier. So that, uh, that, that national data is backing up the information we have on Miami-Dade, which is no surprise because Miami is a indicator city, uh, meaning it is also uh, very often a city that people look to um, economically speaking, the market uh, in Miami to get an idea of what might be happening on a larger scale. Uh, so let's go on. 
who, uh, well, what price ranges do we have here? Sales by price range, you see the majority of, of homes being sold are between 100 and 250,000 and 250 to 500,000, right? So, I mean, that makes up a, a huge, huge portion of the market. Uh, what is that? 76%, something like that of the market that is under 500,000 or under, right? So definitely if you have a home that's 500,000 and under and you're looking to sell, consider that a very positive sign. 10% uh, of the market you see there in the 500 to 750, right? And then you have a very smaller uh, segment of the market, 750 to a million and a million plus. Uh, and then surprisingly, 8% under 100,000. I didn't even know, you know, I'm kidding, I knew. But there's very few homes for sale in Miami that are 100,000 or less, let's just put it that way. Uh, so, you know, but out there in rural areas, of course, you can still buy homes for very cheap. Uh, but not a number my brain normally thinks about when I think about real estate and <laughs> being in Miami. So more props to them. So here's some interesting information that's actually, uh, this is coming from, from NAR, um, from their quarter one metro uh, home price uh, statistics. So I basically have some few things to talk about here. So the first thing, nearly all of the nation's metro areas saw price growth and had minimal inventory increases in the first quarter of 2020, according to the latest quarterly report by NAR. Okay, so what does that mean? That backs up what we said before, okay? So we actually are seeing median sales prices increase while all of this is going on, right? So asterisk to that we're gonna get to, we already mentioned that you know it's kind of, it's mixed data, but uh, we're gonna keep it going because this is quarter one update from NAR. This is important information. Median single family home prices increased year over year in 96% of measured markets in the first quarter with 174 of 181 metropolitan statistical areas showing sales price gains. Okay, so that's a hugely significant percentage of, of metro areas that are seeing median sales uh, prices for single family homes increase. All right, now the national median existing single family home price in the first quarter of 2020 was 274, up 7.7% from the first quarter of 2019 where it was 254, right? So up about $20,000 year over year or 7.7%. So we'll be it'll be interesting to see what the difference is next quarter, uh, but that's encouraging information, right? That even though the Roni Rones happened, you know, at least, I mean, it was for the last like, you know, a couple weeks of the quarter, but it didn't have a drastic enough effect to, to wipe out the gains that we had made that quarter in the real estate industry. So going over here to this star, first star, the first quarter price jump is, uh, mostly reflects conditions prior to the coronavirus outbreak, like I was mentioning, and show the strength of the housing demand prior to the pandemic, said Lawrence Yun, NAR chief economist. Even now, due to very limited listings, home prices are showing no signs of buckling. Okay, so you know, they don't necessarily 100% agree with him in terms of condos. Uh, you know, but here they're really looking at single family homes, mostly it seems. Um, and definitely, you know, the higher the price range, that doesn't necessarily hold true. But overall, we see a really strong housing market and a really strong demand. So even though the, the Roni Rones is happening and going on, the demand for real estate is great. It's, it's very strong. So this, this is encouraging, all right? Um, next star here, in March, the median sales price of existing homes rose 8% on a year-over-year -year basis, like we had mentioned before. Yun, Yun, however he says it, says the strong desire for housing paired with the desire, uh, paired with the dire inventory totals contributed to higher home prices, right? So there's less inventory, but there's still a strong demand. What happens, you know, economics 101, you have low uh, supply, high demand, prices go up, right? Supply is extremely limited and there are simply not as many homes for sale to meet the demand among potential buyers, he said. More supply and more listings are needed to provide a faster recovery for the economy. Okay, well, those are the same things, more supply and more listings, right? Because a listing is the supply, you're just selling a listing as a home, you're selling homes, okay? So what he's saying there is that there's not enough homes for buyers to, to be able to find the home that they want for an effective sale to happen, right? Because um, if you're not finding a home that you want to buy, you're probably not gonna buy a home, right? So they need greater, we need greater inventory across the board uh, in order for more sales to happen, basically, to simplify it, okay? Um, now, the thing is that 
supply is is different in different markets. Keep in mind that real estate is hyper local, but overall supply is limited across the country. So it might not feel like that in your market, uh, but it is definitely the case nationally speaking. Uh, we know that it, we just saw those Miami Dade statistics. We saw you know single family homes in the negative thirty percentile uh, you know of, of new listings. Condos was about negative fifty five percent, right? So we know for sure that the supply here in Miami Dade is super limited, right? Now let's go on to the next red line there. So median single family sales prices were higher across all regions compared to one year ago. All right. So that's that means just everywhere in the country. There's not one region where things are doing terrible. Um, some are maybe better, but you know they're all in the in the green. I'm going to read this last uh, star. This whole thing here about lower mortgage rates have led to better home affordability. Okay, so. Lower mortgage rates have made home purchases more affordable in both uh, 2019 and 2020. The 30 year fixed average at 3.57 in the first quarter of 2020 it was down from 4.62 a year ago. The average monthly mortgage payment on a 30 year fixed uh, with a 20% down was $995, down from $1,048 a year ago. That's equivalent to 15% of the median family income of about 80 grand, down from 16% uh, one year ago. So housing expenses are considered a cost burden if the cost is more than 30% of the income, okay? So let me break down what that means. Mortgage rates are low, like we said before, and that is basically like the, the IV keeping us alive in the housing market right now because if, more, if rates go up, we're kind of screwed, honestly. Uh, if, if rates go up and inventory stays low, we're like super screwed, okay? So we need rates to stay low and we need more inventory to come into the market. Um, so that's just the reality. Now, data for the whole United States. So we have some uh, data actually from Zillow, uh, which owns Realtor.com, and also there's one from, from Redfin. Uh, we know not to take Zillow seriously uh, all the time because like you see in my headline here, Zillow CEO Spencer Raskoff sold his home for much less than the Zestimate. It was like a million dollars less than the Zestimate, <laughs> which is just awesome. Um, so don't take estimates for, you know, any type of worth, but they have access to insane consumer data. They're collecting all of the consumer data on their sites, including your data. So Zillow survey forecasts suburban boom as a remote, as remote workers flee pricey cities in search of bigger homes. So this is a common thing that a common theme I've been hearing over the last week of these CEOs, Zillow and Redfin and other, you know, experts. So on, you know, quote unquote, coming out and saying, you know, people are heading for the hills. They're heading for the rural areas. Uh, you know, here you have, uh, uh, recent survey tied to remote work and how it could affect where Americans want to live with 75% of those working from home saying they would like to continue to do that at least half the time after the health crisis subsides. 75%, that's huge, right? So the work from home desire also leads to two thirds of employees, 66%, who have that option to say that they are at least somewhat likely to consider moving as a result, okay? Now it's not just them taking a swing in the wind here, there's actually, they have the data based on their searches and based on pending sales here, so we're gonna see. So uh, Redfin further reported on the trend Thursday, the data showing that page views for houses in small towns with populations less than 50,000 were up 105%. I don't need to tell you that 105% is statistically significant. That's a lot of, of an increase, okay? Uh, so year over year during the seven day period ending May 1st, all right? Uh, the views climbed 76% for rural counties with fewer than 10,000 people uh, down from a peak of 170% a month earlier, right? So people are looking at, at populations less than 50,000 uh, and they're considering it as a potential place to move and work from home. Um, and, you know, why wouldn't you? You can buy more for your money. So Redfin also said to draw, uh, said the draw to small towns extends beyond browsing to actual sales. While pending home sales are down across the board, less populous areas aren't being hit quite as hard as large cities. So this is where it gets interesting, right? Uh, you know, we, we're seeing less closed sales like we saw earlier with the Miami-Dade statistics. Uh, that's again, indicator city. That's also being replicated across the country, but in less populous areas, non-metro areas, that's not the same exact trend. Uh, it's It might be the same direction, uh, but it's being hit less hard, okay? 
Now well, let's continue on. So a remote home, this is hilarious. Page views of houses in small towns are surging amid the coronavirus pandemic while big cities are staging a more modest comeback. A remote home in the woods in a tiny Illinois village 67 miles southwest of Chicago was one of the most viewed listings on redfin.com in April, complete with a wood burning stove, natural spring running through the property, da da da, looks like Lord of the Rings. You know, and who wouldn't want to search up this home? Look at that thing. It's a butte, right? It looks like it's straight out of the Shire. Uh, you know, just don't uh, pay too close attention to the fact that the master bedroom tub looks like it was built in, you know, the 1950s by some dude who was on acid and you got AstroTurf as your carpet. But look at that skylight. I mean, look at look at that skylight. Look at that. Look at that wood burning stove, right? Put a little, you know, a little spit shine, a little bubble gum on this thing, and it'll be shining, you know. But just, you know, make sure you already, uh, you know, that you're not single, because if you're single, you bring a girl home or a guy home. That's going to be their look on their face when they see the astroturf in your bedroom, and then when they take a closer look at that window that's going to be the face that they make. <laughs> uh, so, you know, not uh, this this uh, webinar or whatever this is, live video is not sponsored by Stuff It. All right, so let's take it back. So we see uh, page views in ho uh, for homes in small towns surge 105% year over year during the seven-day period ending May 1st. Uh, an acceleration from the 85% gain that occurred during the week of April 1st, ending in April 1st, uh, in rural counties with fewer than 10,000 people views climbed 76%. Uh, but this is a deceleration from the 170% rise in the month before. So you might think, okay, well, people are interested, you know, but that doesn't mean that they're out there buying the the Lord of the Rings wannabe home in, you know, 67 miles south of Chicago, right? Somebody probably has bought that by now. But we see year over year change in pending home sales uh, kind of backs it up a little bit. So pending sales plummeted 39% in urban metro areas, right, versus just 25% in both small towns and rural areas. That gap is wider than the one we saw during the week ending in April 1st, uh, when urban metro areas had experienced a 28% decline in pending sales compared with a decrease of 20%, right? So the gap is kind of narrowed. Uh, you know, was narrower in April 1st. Now it's widened out to May 1st. You know, it's becoming more and more interesting to people to be looking at these homes in these rural areas, uh, especially with big companies like, you know, Twitter. Uh, I think Facebook was one of them. Google, um, you know, these big tech companies in California are, are letting their employees know now that they can have the ability to work from home indefinitely. Uh, so, there were 40,952 homes under contract to be sold nationwide during the week ending May 1st, a 35% decrease from the same year, uh, from the same period the prior year. That's an improvement from the 41.7% drop that occurred when pending sales bottomed in mid April. Okay, so it's still a decrease year over year nationally for those pending sales. And remember, this is coming from Redfin, not NAR, but it's just another data point. Um, it may still be a decrease of 35%, but it's become less of a decrease than it was the month before, uh, which was 41.7, right? So we've gained, you know, 6.7%. United States continued. So when talking about real estate nationally, like I said before, we have to understand that real estate's hyper local and that local markets are all super different. Even within the same city or metro area, you can have very different markets like from Brickell to Coconut Grove. They're super close, but they're totally different real estate markets. And in addition to the seemingly limitless economic and societal factors, there are a lot of factors that play into how each hyper local market is behaving, including, but not limited to the number of active listings, number of new listings, months of inventory, average sales price, list price to sales price ratio, days on market. I could go on, but you get the point. Uh, you can't just boil this all down to one stat, one data point, one clickbait headline. There's a lot of information here to parse out, and we're really just scratching the surface here on this presentation. You can tell um, there's a lot to be said. So will the housing market collapse like in 2008? Well, it all depends on how much the overall economy is affected and how long the virus has businesses shut down. To get a, a loan, banks now want more money down, lower debt to income, uh, which is your DTI. That means your your basically how much how many liabilities dollar wise what your your dollar amount of liabilities are compared to your monthly income, right? So if you have a 
thousand dollar car payment and you make two thousand dollars a month you have a 50 dti um, so higher credit scores is another thing that they want like i said before HELOCs home equity equity line of credit now requires a 720 credit score which is up from 660 before that's coming from bank of america and chase uh, but you know other banks are likely to follow in their in their steps um, there's more stringent VOE verification of income. I mean, sorry, uh, verification of employment. Before it would be, you know, a couple weeks before you closed, they would call the lender would call your work and make sure you still work there. Now they're calling three days before or the day before, even in some cases. Uh, so you know, if because things are changing so quickly, uh, so I don't I don't blame them, but it's something to be aware of. Self-employment numbers, if you're unable to show bank statements, will be based on your tax returns, which is considered your qualifying income, and reducing it by 25% off the top to give the lender more wiggle room to work with. So <clears throat> if you're unemployed, that's an important thing to, to keep in mind. Slightly higher interest rates uh, are, are also going to be you know, something that, that could happen uh, and we've seen it a little bit but it hasn't held they've been going down lately but we've seen them go up a little bit come back down but basically it's because there's so much demand for cheap money right now and plus everything that's going on and the lenders and banks expecting some amount of foreclosures in the near to not so distant future it's making interest rates go you know they're a little bit crazier than normal uh, and they're already normally crazy so again, this is just a snapshot. There's way more that fits into than what fits into a PowerPoint. Um, so we'll, you know, uh, just keep that in mind. So uh, for investors, rental income can only be used um, if you have. I suppose say if you have a FICO score of 700 greater than 700, and you can document six months, six months of reserves uh, for each financed property. That means you need to have six months. Of, of money squirreled away to take care of all the maintenance and you know uh, paying the you know the management company and you know anything that might break or uh, you know also just all the expenses of, of having a, of a investment property you need to have six months worth of those expenses saved up and a greater than 700 credit score in order to qualify for investment properties right now. Um, again, this changes day to day, so this is just what it is now. Who knows what tomorrow brings? Um, so, uh, and if you don't have those reserves uh, stocked up, then they'll deduct those expenses from your income and you'll qualify with what's left over. So if you have a really high income, you might still be good. If you don't, maybe not. That's coming from JP Morgan, but again, uh, what the few big banks are doing now may soon be copied by the smaller banks or the smaller banks could be even more strict. What does this all mean? So what we should expect to see in the future includes, but is certainly not limited to, less qualified buyers in the buyer pool. My personal guess is about 20 to 30%. I'm leaning more towards the 30% could go higher for the near future because of the new and constantly changing slash tougher loan requirements, newly unemployed people who were actively looking. So they were looking, but now they're unemployed and they're just like, crap, what do I do now? Can't be, you know, I'm not in the market for home anymore. And also the fears of, of transmission of the virus, right? People might not necessarily, if you were just going to go look for a home, but you don't really need one, maybe you're not going out to look for a home right now because you'd rather be you know safe at home uh, so this actually means less competition for qualified buyers but as i said earlier it'll be more qualified competition uh, so this also means less demand, which usually results in reduced prices. Um, but remember, hyper-local markets, so it's different everywhere. Uh, or the sellers having to accept terms that they wouldn't have before, right? So we 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 know that having less buyers, right, means less demand. If there's less demand, then there should be less prices or less. Uh, the prices should be less. But we're also seeing a smaller supply of inventory. So that. That's what's keeping us from seeing a big drop in prices right now, um, among a few other things. But that's a big reason. So also, we uh, will potentially see an uptick in short, uh, short sales and foreclosures later if a large portion of homeowners are unable to pay their mortgages, um, especially if they're unable to pay the, the, the lump sum at the end of their, uh, of their forbearance. I really hope that a lot of people don't get screwed over by that because I see a big disaster coming with that if something's not done. But anyways, that's another 
presentation. <laughs> Probably more help from the Fed will be coming as well as some uh, above average inflation. But remember, inflation isn't always bad. You actually don't want to see deflation during something like this because that means that, you know, the economy, people aren't out there spending money and just, you know, the economy is really going down the drain if you're seeing deflation during a pandemic like this while the government's printing a trillion dollars every two seconds, um, being hyperbolic, of course. But, you know, we'll probably see maybe a little above average inflation. Like normally it's like 2%-ish. You know, maybe we see more in the 3 to 4%-ish. Um, it could, you know, if we do see really bad inflation, though, it's not going to be right away. It's going to be years down the line, like four, five, six years down the line. Um, but that's a whole other presentation in and of itself as well. Depending on how severe this all is, it could result in a long-term change in the amount of people who can afford to purchase and an increase in the amount of renters. So... That's kind of self-explanatory. I mean, just depending on how this whole unemployment thing shakes out, really, I mean, whole classes of, of people who, you know, types of workers who could normally before would be able to buy a home, maybe now they can't. Um, so uh, in total, uh, if, if there's a total of 7 million, this is an example, if there's a total of 7 million households that request forbearance, uh, and people sell or refinance on every, average every seven years, then next year we could see one seventh of those people out of the market. So that would equal a million less people involved in real estate transactions. Okay. Um, so that's not good. A little less than uh, six million. There were, there were a little less than six million uh, real estate transactions in 2018, which is six. 15% less just because of mortgage forbearance. Um, so that's saying basically if you take that 6 million, right, and you figure out that one seventh, you know, 16% less just because of mortgage forbearance. So that's not taking, uh, you know, other factors into account. That's only the mortgage forbearance. So do not take a mortgage forbearance if you absolutely do not have to. Okay, Jake, but come on, tell me what I really want to know. Are prices going down or what? All right. So probably with less able buyers, let me move this guy down. <laughs> Good old Sammy. All right, so there probably will prices probably will go down a little bit uh, with less able buyers in the market. Investment properties could be hit the hardest though, especially if tenants aren't paying rent uh, and lenders are being more strict on issuing loans on investment properties. Um, the crisis is going to also affect greatly those who are not paying their mortgage, uh, lost their job. Uh, and then find no other way to restructure their payments after the forbearance period. So the severity of that, as I've been saying, depends on how long all this lasts, assistance from the government, and also how much buyer activity there is at the time when, whenever that homeowner is in default or needs to short sale or foreclose, uh, do a foreclosure sale or whatever it is that they're doing. Uh, basically, how much buyer activity is out there at that time is also going to depend on um, you know, how all that shakes out. So only do mortgage forbearance if you absolutely must, since they are usually due as a lump sum at the end of the forbearance period. You can tell I've, I'm preaching don't take mortgage forbearances here uh, if you really don't have to. I think it's just not great. It's a bad, bad deal. Um, so oop, go back. Next slide. Should I wait to sell? Well, right now we're at the beginning of a downward market. Um, we're starting from a baseline of near all-time highs as far as prices. So, you know, it might be a good time to sell if you're thinking of, of selling because prices, if they do go lower, uh, you would have missed out on selling now when prices are still near an all-time high. Uh, if you lost your job and can't pay your mortgage payments and do a mortgage forbearance, it'll be due at the end of the forbearance period in one full lump sum or else you risk foreclosure. Now is a good time for that person to cash out their equity. Okay. So if you are thinking of a mortgage forbearance, maybe it's better to just cash out your equity, right? Especially if you bought between 2008 and 2013, when property prices were in the gutter and maybe rent for a while and, and use that cash to support yourself while finding a new job or starting a business. I get it. Nobody wants to go from owning to renting. That totally is not optimal but it's better than going you know, through foreclosure and having that on your record for seven years or even a short sale lasts on your record for three years and then your credit is screwed. And I mean, just trust me, that's gonna be a much bigger headache than making a, a, 
you know, instead of a monthly mortgage payment, you're making a monthly rent payment, right? I mean, just basically suck it up and kill your ego and just go rent and use the cash that you have to support yourself, right? Rent under your means. And, you know, if now, if you've ever thought about starting a business, now's the time to do it, especially if you can cash out that equity and use it to help support your business. Just make sure that you're being financially responsible. That's the key to it all. Should I wait to buy? Well, lenders have upped their requirements, so definitely check with the lender if you, uh, you know, if you want to see if you're still qualified. If you don't have a lender, contact me. I have a lot of great ones that I work with, uh, and actually, my main lender, David DeMarchena, is he commented on the comment section there. If you guys want to click his profile and send him a message. Um, but definitely give me a call and, and I can set you up if you're not in Miami uh, with a lender in your market. If you have cash or you have good income and credit, you're in an excellent position to get a good deal on whatever you buy. So it might not be, you know, 20% off or something like that, or 10, you might not even be 10% off, but you're definitely in a good position. If you have cash or a lot of cash for a down payment uh, and you have good income and credit, then you're in a really good position, honestly. Uh, if you're still employed, et cetera, et cetera, right? Then you know you're you're ahead of a lot of people right now, and you're kind of the creme de la creme of who lenders are looking for. If that's not you, you may have a tough time getting a house, or you may have to wait until you meet the new requirements from lenders. If you currently do not meet those requirements, so let's say you meet all the requirements, but you have a 600 credit score. Okay, well, you know, you need to work on your credit for a few months or, you know, six months, a year, however long it takes you to get your credit up to uh, a level that they will accept uh, and qualify you for a mortgage um, because now they've gotten string more stringent. However, caveat to that is that, you know, they got more stringent with the credit requirements. They could get less stringent if things start to go really well. So we'll see. When should you be ready to invest? If you're an investor, lenders have upped their requirements like we said, so check with the lender again. If you need a lender for investment properties, let me know, give me a call, uh, and uh, I'll help you out for sure. Mortgage credit availability index equaled negative 16.1% in March. Uh, conventional was negative 24%. Government loans, FHA, VA, USDA, which is like farms and stuff, was down negative six, almost negative seven. Jumbos down negative 37%. Uh, this was from March. I didn't have, find these numbers for April, but you know they, it was basically harder to get these loans, right? So it was 16% harder in March on average to get a loan, uh, especially conventional and jumbo. Uh, jumbos actually were suspended. Some lenders have started doing them again and, you know, like Regions is doing them. But, uh, and then I have another lender who I work with who uh, basically he can get jumbos from uh, Chase because he, uh, he's not, uh, he's a corollary with Chase, a correspondent lender. He's not a lender with Chase, but loans are complicated. We don't need to go into all that right now. Uh, but just know it's, tougher to get a loan. So if you have cash, good income and credit, you're in an excellent position to get a deal. Like we said, if that's not you, you might have a tough time. Okay. So same thing with, if you're, you know, should I, when should you be ready to buy? Right. Similar thing for, for looking to invest. Okay. Strategies, how to get ahead, how to make money at a time when there's a lot of uncertainty, uncertainty, banks are making it harder for regular people without a ton of wealth and assets to buy real estate. Realize there are two very different general paths depending on what you think is going to happen, okay? If you think the Fed will stop printing money and that prices will go down, <laughs> like prices will go down in the long term, uh, which is deflation, then you want to be stockpiling cash, gold, maybe Bitcoin if you're a Bitcoin person, uh, but you, you know, you want to not be, you know, buying uh, commodities and things like that. You want to be stockpiling cash, basically, if you think the Fed is going to stop printing money. Um, i not telling you what to think, but kind of seems a little unlikely because that printing press is just cranked up to full blast. If you think the Fed will, be, uh, will keep printing money, hmm, maybe, to prop up the economy, Prices will go up in the long term, which is inflation. So we've seen a lot of signs of this. The government's basically come out and said as much as, you know, we're going to be willing to do whatever it takes uh, to keep this economy going. So if this is the case you think is most likely, the only way to get ahead is to get into assets. So the easy and these are just some examples. An easy and safe method of getting into assets is dollar cost average index funds on red days. So that means if you, you know, Go look at index funds. There's a lot of different services you can, you know, deposit your money into index funds. Uh, you know, Charles Schwab or Robinhood or you know all kinds of different apps and stuff. You can look them up. But you know, you go in when the market is all red, when most things are red. That's a day to invest, right? 
Um, if they're all green, then you don't invest, right? So dollar cost average index funds. Another safe method is uh, to just basically have cash, uh, you know, as much as possible for a down payment and get pre-approved to buy a wedge deal, meaning real estate that is under market value, okay? So you don't want to buy a home that's worth 100000 for $100,000. You want to buy it for like $80,000, right? And that way, even if the market drops, it'd have to drop 20% for you to be even at break even, right? So wedge deals are what it's all about. And HODL, hold on for dear life. This is not necessarily, in my opinion, a great economy for doing flips. It can be done. I'm not saying that you can't do flips right now. You can do flips if you want to do flips, but it's a very, it's a more risky economy. It's a more risky moment to be, you know, angling towards that, that flip uh, for your source of income because, you know, timing is everything with flips. It's hard to, you know, things are taking longer, first of all, which makes flips harder to be profitable. Government, you know, uh, buildings are shut down, which makes permitting and stuff way harder. I, I just really think it's not a good time for flips. Uh, here's an aggressive strategy, bounce back stocks. So we know the stock market's very volatile. So stocks that you think are selling for under market value, uh, or they could be REITs or REEFs, uh, which is real estate investment trund, trust or real estate investment fund. Um, you can use the equity that you build in those stocks to invest into good real estate deals. So that's probably what, you know, if you saw when the stock market really plummeted, uh, you know, a few weeks back or whatever, and you invested like a ton of money into some of those stocks that you knew were going to bounce back and now you're sitting on a bunch of equity in those stocks you know you can take that equity out and put it into a safer thing like a real estate wedge deal and if that's something that you're looking to do definitely hit me up because that is something i can absolutely help you with um, so also a 30-year fixed mortgage is one of the best ways to hedge against inflation especially at today's rates so money is so cheap right? You know, the, the, the uh, mortgage rate is almost less than the rate of inflation every year. So that means every year, the amount you owe on your mortgage, it's this, it'll be, you know, the same dollar amount minus the principal that you've paid down, but it'll be less real dollars, rest, less real value, real money, uh, you know, 20 years from now, 30 years from now than it is today, right? So, you know, that's another reason why I think we've seen cash sales going down uh, consistently for the last few years. Keeping it going. Strategies how to get ahead continue for first time buyers, buyers, sellers, and investors. So buyers, get pre-qualified and or approved. Compile as much cash as you can for that down payment. Find an excellent realtor. You're way ahead in that department because you know me. Uh, and shop for lenders. Off-market deals and wedge deals are your friends. I get it that people want move-in ready, but don't let the fact that a house needs a new fresh coat of paint stop you from buying it at a discount, baby. Uh, find a panic seller or someone who must sell at all costs. I know that might not sound the best, but there's people who need to sell. So you're not really like doing them dirty. You're actually the opposite. You're helping them out. You're bailing them out of the situation that they're in where they need to sell, right? So become familiar with the new tech used in showings, open houses. So basically Zoom, Don't I don't recommend Facebook Live because I've not been impressed. <laughs> Anyways, be proactive, don't give up. Uh, I don't recommend looking into land vi land deals, development, or commercial right now. Um, that's more for investors. First time buyers, learn about the process. Be better informed. Use this time to learn. Make better decisions and have a leg up on the less informed first time buyers. Because as you see, that's about 34% of, uh, of the population of people buying right now, uh, as you saw earlier in the presentation. Stack that cash. All right, borrow from your family, whatever you have to do legally, but understand that if you don't qualify, if you maybe lost your job or you no longer meet those stringent requirements, or if you don't have enough cash, this period of time might be the best for you to keep increasing your cash, gaining assets you can afford, like those in index funds, and learning to prepare for when you are ready, okay? So if you're not quite ready, don't be, don't be discouraged. Just keep stacking that cash, keep getting better informed, and you know, keep your eye on the market, stay vigilant, and uh, talk to me because I'll help you out. Uh, so get pre-qualified uh, pre and or pre-approved, find an excellent realtor who is responsive, attention to detail, cares, and is amicable. You get along with them, right? So this is a little more in depth than what I put for just buyers because first time buyers, really important to work with a realtor who actually cares. Imagine that, right? 
uh, and somebody who has attention to detail because this is your first time going through the process. So you don't want somebody who's going to drop the ball on anything. You also want somebody who's responsive. They're going to answer your calls when you call them because you might have a question at nine o'clock at night because you've never bought a home before and the next day is the closing and you have a question about something, right? Uh, so you want somebody you can depend on to answer their phone. Find a good lender who's willing to guide you through the loan process, right? Realtors know a ton about loans and mortgages, but we are not the experts in that. That is the mortgage lender, the loan originator, uh, who is going to be able to tell you every single thing A to Z about the loan, right? So realize you need a great realtor, but you also need a good lender who's willing to help guide you through that process if you're a first time buyer, because it can, it's kinda, it can get complicated. It's simple, but it's not. Off-market deals, wedge deals, panic sellers, again, are going to be your friend. Become familiar with the new tech, again, and be proactive. Sellers, well, you've already decided you're going to sell or that you need to sell, so maybe you could consider refinancing to fund your purchase and rent your current home for passive income, right? Since rates are so low, yeah, it's not a bad time to consider that as an option. And you don't have to uh, be a landlord if you don't want to. You can have a management company do it for you and still be coming out ahead financially. So AKA, you have a home right now, you say, let's say you have 300,000 in equity. All right, well, you know, you can take out enough uh, equity to put a down payment on a new home, right? And then rent out your place that you're currently at. And from that rent, uh, you know, pay not just the the mortgage that you have remaining on that house, but use it to help you potentially pay your new mortgage as well, right? So your new mortgage could be less than it would have been if you just would rent out that uh, that that home, your original home. Act quickly if you're a seller. The top of the market still, right? Like we said, so we're starting from a baseline of all-time highs. If you're thinking about selling, stop thinking and start doing, okay? Find a great listing agent, aka yours truly. Give me a call. Uh, somebody who can optimize selling in the current market. You want somebody who is tech savvy, um, you know, more tech savvy than Facebook is apparently because I can't have a pip screen of me while I'm doing this presentation, Facebook. Um, so you want someone with a heavy online strategy and comprehension, excellent photos, videos, drone photo, video, 3D models, walkthroughs, someone who's accountable and has good work ethic, okay? So this is not the time for the burnt out 80-year-old realtor who doesn't know how to log into their email and they just have been doing things since they had MLS books and you know they really aren't on top of things anymore. God bless them, but this is not the time to use them as a listing agent. You want somebody who is ahead of the curve, somebody who's on the vanguard, all right? Price it right the first time. Competitive pricing beats the competition and avoids getting caught in a downward spiral, okay? So we talked about that starting at the baseline of an all-time high. Well, if we are going to be going down and you're priced high, too high to sell, and then your house doesn't sell, but the market goes down, guess what? You're going to have to reprice lower. So you might as well start it out at the right price at the starting point. And like it says there, competitive pricing beats the competition. Number one, probably you should have put here, listen to your realtor, not your emotions. <laughs> I'm a little biased on that. But in general, this goes for not just sellers, but buyers, investors, whoever it is. Listen to your realtor, uh, not your emotions, because your emotions might be telling you to do one thing, but your realtor doesn't have the same emotions as you do. They're looking at it from a standpoint of, is this logical? Is this the best thing for my client? Does this make sense? Do the numbers work? Is this gonna be long-term what they are actually needing and looking for? Um, and amongst other things. So just listen to your realtor, not your emotions, all right? Investors, prepare your war chest, get that gold ready, not actual gold, but get your, your cash ready. Be patient, wait for those wedge deals, leverage the financing, even if you usually buy all cash. I say this to investors who say they buy cash all the time because I don't understand why people are still buying houses for cash. If you can get a, a mortgage interest rate of like three and a half percent, and then you can go get like seven to 10% on your money, why are you buying cash for houses? I don't understand it at all. I, like, even if you have millions and millions of dollars, like, it just doesn't make sense. So, anyways, 
consider liquidating positions with 100% plus equity to use for new positions. So if you have a house paid off at, you know, say a single family home at 500,000, well, that would equal five single family homes at 500,000 each that are discounted and could be worth 600,000 later on, right? So you put a 20% down payment of $100,000 on a $500,000 home. If you sell a $500,000 home that you have 100% equity in, well, you could do that five times, right? Now you have five properties instead of one and they might be discounted because of what's going on and you gained an extra $500,000 of net worth uh, in equity once the market recovers. Call your realtor, let them know what you're looking for, use their resources. Don't wait for your realtor to call you if you're looking to invest actively because your realtors are, you know, they're helping, you know, people who are actively buying right now because things are crazy and things are taking more time from your realtor. So not saying you need to stay on their heels, but if you're somebody who you talked to your realtor last six months ago and, you know, now things are happening and you're thinking you might want to take advantage of it, go ahead and shoot them a text, let them know, hey, I'm, you know, I'm looking to invest and I guarantee you that they will be on top of the ball if they're a good realtor. Uh, you know, and if financing, talk to your lender to confirm those requirements. Like we said before, go ahead and get that approval. Off-market deals, wedge deals, panic seller, someone who has to sell, those are your friends. Become familiar with that new tech. Be proactive, stay educated, up to date on the constantly changing market. Stay away from land developments, commercial, including apartment buildings. Uh, I think those are just risky investments right now. Get ready to screenshot this. We're coming to the end of the presentation. I see there's still some people on. Thank you so much for watching and listening and all that. I hope that this provided you value. It will be a pinned video on my profile for a while and it'll be on my profile, uh, my, my Facebook page, my real estate page, as well as my public personal profile. Uh, I'll also be uploading it to my YouTube as well. Uh, so get ready to screenshot this, three, two, one. That's my information, so reach out to me. I guarantee you no other realtor in Miami or beyond is going to give you better results or treat you better or take care of you better than I will, million percent guarantee. Uh, so go ahead and screenshot my information, jot it down, follow me on IG, send me an email, follow my YouTube, there it is, uh, so that you can watch this later on and share it or whatever you wanna do, honestly. Um, I have some other good content on there. And thank you guys so much for watching. This has been Clarity 2, an interactive update on real estate versus coronavirus.